Hello. Thank you all for coming to the special presentation this evening. I'm just thrilled that you could be here. And we are so excited to have Chief Judith Manthe of the Wyandotte Nation of Kansas with us. The Wyandots originated in the Georgian Bay of Ontario, Canada. They refer to themselves as Wendot, or people of the islands. The Wyandotte Nation has maintained an uninterrupted presence in the state of Kansas since 1843, when they were forced from their land in Ohio under the Indian Removal Act. They are a very active and dynamic community that live to preserve the tradition, and traditions and culture and teach and share their history. Judy Manthe is a member of the Bear Clan and was elected Principal Chief of the Wyandotte Nation of Kansas in 2000. She grew up on her family's farm just north of Piper. She's always been committed to serving others through 4-H, her church, and other community groups. She's a retired seamstress and has worked several year, for several years perfecting the correct traditional dress for her nation's ceremonial feast. So please join me in welcoming Chief Judy Manny. Thank you, Ann. I'm sorry, I'm running on Indian time, so <laughs> that's a that's a whole thing that we use down at the Pal or at the, the Wyandotte Nation. We're always running late. <laughs> well, hi, Amatru. That means hello, friends. Um, Tron, Tron Hayek. Yatse, Tron Hayek is my Native American name. It means she is in the sky and is happy. Wyandotte Nation of Kansas Midday. Zane family, Bear Clan, Indare. Saskanonia. Saskanonia means how are you? And your response would be Yaskanonia. And that means I am doing well. <laughs> We have actively been working on our language. I took language class through the year, through the school year, every Tuesday night, through Wind Up Nation of Oklahoma. Um, we have been um, able to get it because it's so incredibly hard. Like eight lessons, I printed all the paperwork out from the book. For eight lessons. <laughs> So it's very intense, very hard to pronounce some of the words. Um, okay, Anne asked me if I Kansas. Well, Windup County is my home. We, we made Windup. <laughs> W-Y-A-N-D-O-T-T was Kansas City, Kansas. Um, we have the cemetery, the Huron Cemetery. Uh, we are more than happy to give tours to that. We're also happy to give tours to Quindaro. Quindaro is where we started the Underground Railroad in 18, 1856. A um, little bit of our history. When we came to uh, Kansas City, Kansas, it was during the Indian Removal Act in 1843. We were last. Native American tribe to be forced out of the East. Um, they cried when we left Upper Sandusky. We were living, we had already assimilated. We had already lived as white, stressed as white. Um, my fifth great grandfather, no, I see if you can use the mic. Okay, okay. Here. My fifth great grandfather, Chief Tarhe knew after the Battle of Fallen Timber and he signed the Peace Treaty of um, Greenfield, knew there was no hope for us, knew that there would never be any time that the Indians would be able to survive, that we did have to assimilate. Um, so they stayed as long as they could. They came in 1843 by riverboat, came down the it was really funny, I was reading some of the reports, and they traveled by um, horseback and carriage down to Cincinnati from Upper Sandusky. Upper Sandusky, or Upper Sandusky was our home. We originated, of course, from Canada, went to Detroit, well, through the Straits, Michelle Mackinac down through um, Detroit, and then eventually the tribe pretty much separated because of religion. 
So we lived in Upper Sandusky for years. We loved it up there. We really hated to leave. We did not want to leave. We did not want to leave the graves of our ancestors. It was so hard for us that no one would be there to clean the graves off and take care of the graves. So we went to Cincinnati and there's a newspaper report that says that all of the people came out to see the last of the savage Indians <laughs> leave the east. And what did they find? They found people dressed just better than they were in carriages and horses and animals that were better than what the settlers then had. So we came down to Cincinnati and we boarded a river boat. Two river boats, the Nauterweg and the Republic. And the river boat captain, when he realized he was transporting Native Americans, ripped out all the carpet and said, these are dirty Indians, you know, they'll tear everything up. So he herded us on like cattle. So we went down the Ohio to the Mississippi, Mississippi to the Missouri, Missouri to the Caw, and right there, I'm sure all of you know where the bottom grounds in front of the stockyards are. That's where we were pretty much just dumped out. We were promised 148,000 acres. It wasn't there when we got here. The first year we lost over 60 people to cholera, bad conditions in the bottom grounds. We looked for the highest grounds and we made an agreement with the Delaware Indians. And because of good faith, we had given the Delaware land in Ohio to live on after, after the Iroquois Confederation had pretty much sold out their land and kicked them off of their land, we gave them a place to live. So in good faith, they sold us 36 sections of land and gave us three for churches and schools. We looked for the highest ground, and that's where the Huron Cemetery is. How many of you know where the Huron Cemetery is? Very good. Um, wrapped in blankets, they dug mass graves. The next year, a flood came through. The flood was so bad, they said, after the flood waters went down, there were buffalo hung up in the top of the trees. And we were done in the bottom grounds. We had to go for high ground. We lost another hundred people, wrapped them in blankets and buried them in mass graves. It was um, a real hard start. One of the first things we built when we got to Kansas were churches. The Seventh Street Methodist Church, does everybody know where that is or have any idea? Well, that's going to be um, repurposed I'm on the committee with Kansas City Community College and they are they purchased the land and are gonna make a complex there. But I was real upset at first. I thought, oh, doggone it. I don't want this historical building destroyed because my grandma went to church there. My grandma grew up on Sandusky Street. And if you notice, most of the streets in downtown Kansas City are all named after us. Um, so anyway, back to the church. Kent City Community College is going to repurpose all of the building materials they can. The stained glass windows, the architectural details, the stone foundation, the bricks. They have, I've, I've got pictures of it. It's just amazing how they're going to incorporate it into this building. And I'm really tickled that they're going to be able to do this and use it at least because the, the church when I went to visit it is is way far too long. There's no saving it. So at least part of the history will be there. Um, do any of you know about the Conley sisters? Okay, the Conley sisters. <laughs> I give a really good talk on that one. They were my cousins. Um, they Kansas City, Kansas wanted to buy the cemetery. They wanted to move all the bodies. They wanted to dig them up and take them to the Quindaro Cemetery and bury them in a mass grave. Well, when they built in, I, I don't remember when the Huron building, I've got to look that up, uh, was built, but when they built that Huron building on the west side of the cemetery, they dug up remains. Do you know what they did with them? 
cái gam trình là cái nó no desire to protect our history or anything. And I'm so glad of NAPRA and, and the Protection Acts that they cannot do that anymore. But Kansas City, Kansas wanted to build a parking lot under the cemetery, or a parking lot over the cemetery. You wanted an underpass through underneath the cemetery. I'm not sure how they were going to do that. Um, they, they wanted to do so many things and they fought hard to get that land. The Conley sisters, Lida Conley, in 1905, I believe, five or six, got her law degree in Kensington, Missouri, went to the Supreme Court as the first Native American woman to go before the Supreme Court. She didn't win her case, but she got attention. People from all over the United States, from the East Coast to the West, Coast. We have newspaper articles of Chicago, New York, California, everywhere. People were sending money to them. Lida even got marriage proposals. <laughs> but those girls never got married. They stayed there. But when they didn't, she didn't win her case. They marched up those steps. They slammed the gates shut and padlocked them, put a sign over it, said, Trespassers, beware. And they moved into a shack that our fellow, um, my grandfather, I'm sure, helped to build, six by eight, called Fort Conley. They moved in, and they lived there for two solid years, summer and winter, and they allowed no one on that property. And they were a force to be continued with. Wind up Nation of Oklahoma, um, they were convinced by... William Conley, who is not related to the Conley sisters, that they would be able to make some money. And they tried to get <coughs> federal court to <coughs> portray the land so they could have the money. Well, in the end, they would have only gotten about $15 per person. It wasn't worth it, but it made a lot of hard feelings. We have since healed as many of those hard feelings as we possibly can. Um, so growing up Wyandotte, my grandma had always told me, in fact, my cousin Jan English was the chief before me, and she sat us down at a place on the family farm, and it's called Flat Rock. It's a beautiful area, big, huge flat rocks in the creek that you can wade with waterfalls and all. And this is just at the very south end of Leavenworth County, just before Piper. And told both of us our history and told both of us we were the ones that were going to bring this nation back. And Jen has done an absolutely superior job in getting all the information. Darren, her son, typed Every bit of the website that was on there was typed by him by hand. There was no cut and paste. It was hand typed. It's an act of love. And we shared it with Oklahoma. We shared it with everybody. But she also told us, don't ever forget your great grandfather. Your fifth great grandfather was Chief Tarhead, a very important peacekeeper. He was he was a he was a warrior. At 10 years old, he fought at the Battle of Braddock. Can you imagine that 10-year-old? But he fought these wars, but he finally figured out there was just no way that they were going to win. So he backed off and he said, we've got to make peace. We've got to, uh, we've got to assimilate and be as the whites if we're going to survive. So living in Kansas City, I didn't get to come down here very much. I was always in southern um, Leavenworth County. Um, never saw the cemetery, and this is so sad to me, really, but I understand it. My folks would not let us come down to Kansas City, Kansas, because the drug paraphernalia, the bones that were living in the cemetery, it was just a horrendous place at the time. It wasn't until the 2000s that I even got to see 
my grandparents' graves. And every one of my grandparents are buried there, except for my grandma and grandpa. I even have an uncle, Zangre Youngmans, that's buried there. Grandma always, I was always with Grandma. She lived right up the hill from me. We talked so much. She brought out the books and she read our history. She told me our history. Don't ever forget our history. Don't ever forget who you are. But you just don't need to broadcast that's your one dot. And I know Jan English said that at times that she had, um, she was waiting for a school bus one time and two boys were just beating the tar out of somebody and she went up and said, stop it, stop it. Why are you beating on this boy? And they said, oh, he's Indian. And she said, well, so am I. And they said, well, you better be quiet or we'll have to beat you up too. You know, that's, uh, I know growing up there were times pioneers that had come forth, you know, TV programs portrayed the Indians as horrible savages and everything. We weren't that way. We were very um, educated. A lot of our people went on to do major things in life. I love my culture. I just got back from Wyandotte, Oklahoma. Anna was down there with me. Um, when I go down there, it's, it, well, we go down first for the green corn ceremony, which is a naming feast. And usually it's the babies that are getting named. The green corn feast is a Thanksgiving for all of the harvest coming. And Richard Zayn Smith, my cousin, speaks the language pretty well. And the first time I heard him, I thought, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but now that I'm taking the language, I can pick up on the language better. Um, I had the privilege of taking the place of a faith keeper that was in the hospital, and my sister and nephew and his daughter came down to be named. And I had the privilege of taking them to the speaker and having their names given to them this year. It was absolutely a wonderful time. Then starts the gathering. Oh my gosh. It's like everybody wind up gets together and it's, it's like when I go down there and when I go to Canada, I didn't know for the longest time, I knew when I went to Oklahoma, I felt full. When I went to Canada, oh my gosh, it was like a hole in my heart was filled. I didn't even know these people up there. None of them. And it's like we just come to make him to me, started talking to me. And it's, I still on Facebook are friends with so many of them. I even got a, a text from um, one inviting me to, and I haven't told David this yet, <laughs> inviting me to Montreal. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I'll be able to go because it's in October, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this gets pretty costly at times, but I love it. I love my people. I love being with everybody. My heart is so full when I'm down there. And then we do the powwow, and I was able to do the grand entry right behind uh, Chief Billy and Second Chief um, Norman Hildebrandt and the princesses. And that is, uh, to me, it's not, it's not a big thing. It's not a showy thing, but it's representing my nation that I am there. Um, so growing up, Wanda, it's really kind of funny because my 25th class reunion, um, one of my classmates, had, he's a pharmacist in Window Rock, Arizona, and he's married to a Navajo gal. And oh my gosh, she was so uncomfortable, just squirming she was so uncomfortable. And finally we were sitting at a table and I said, I'm going to tell you something about me that none of you know. And when I told them I was Native American and I was wind up, they were just blown away. 
You should just keep on talking about it growing up. You know, you didn't talk about it because so many times the children were taken away from the parents forcefully put in boarding schools. Um, there's just so many incidents. If you were Indian, you were discriminated against. Down in Oklahoma this week, we had a, a domestic violence talk. And I was just blown away by the speaker when she said that so many times, like there was a Native American child bitten by a dog and the police wouldn't come because she was Indian. This is today. This is ridiculous. Or something had happened criminally wise and they would not come because they were Indian. And I, I did not have to grow up that way and I'm so thankful I didn't. I mean, number one, um, my grandfather wouldn't have allowed it. <laughs> um, my mother's side of the family, I don't know if any of you know, <coughs> Federal Judge Arthur J. Stanley Jr., he was appointed by Eisenhower, was a federal judge in Kansas City, and he, he fought for a lot of our causes on the cemetery, but then had to recluse himself because of his wind-up grandchildren. Grandmother grew up in Quindaro. My mother grew up in Quindaro. We have so many ties on both sides of the family that connect us together. It's just amazing. But I guess in Wyandotte, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't see any negativity. I knew I was Native American all along. Never connected the thought of my love for the ground being my Native American heritage. When Dad would plow the fields, and the furrow of that dark, beautiful brown earth would turn over so cool, my shoes would come off, and I'd be walking the furrows, and just the feel of the earth under my feet. And I've always had to have my hands in the ground. I've always loved plants. I've always loved, well, that goes back to our history. And one thing, when I was in Canada, I did the reburial in 2013. We reburied 1,785 skeletal remains. These were natives that had been dug up from archaeological sites, and they were stored in the Royal Ontario Museum for years. And finally, uh, Wendake. We have four bands, by the way. There's Wendake up in Quebec. Um, there is Detroit, Anderdon, Kansas, and Oklahoma. When Wendake got the remains, that was the most impacting experience of my life, to be able to carry. I mean, they weren't skeletal remains as to a whole body. They were boxes of skulls, boxes of hands, boxes of leg bones. They dug a pit the size of a football field. We walked down a dirt ramp. When Ducky had purchased beaver pelts and put the beaver pelts all on the ground for each site that they had dug up. We walked down and passed the boxes to the when Ducky at the bottom and they gently pulled them, poured them out and then they broke the boxes down and put them in another pit because there was bone dust in the boxes. Very impacting. By the time we were done, there were two huge piles that were taller than my head, reached just the sides of the dugout. You could just barely walk through. There were six smaller sites of where they had dug them up, and then one single skeleton. After we were done, they brought beaker pelts in and put them all over the top. They covered them all up. This is what was called the Feast of the Dead. And this is how we celebrated our dead or buried our dead.
every 10 years we would have a feast of the dead. So the bodies that died in between that were put on a scaffold, left to rot until they needed to be cleaned or could be cleaned. The bones were gently cleaned so well that they wrapped them in rawhide and put them under their bunks in the longhouses until the next Feast of the Dead. You're getting a lot of information that people don't generally get. Um, just made such an impact on my life. I just couldn't stop from the very beginning to the very end. I did it. I did not stop those. Then they brought in the Wendaki women had cooked pots of soup and they had pots of soup that they brought in and put sporadically through um, the piles of bones. And we had brought gifts in and put them in little baskets and they placed those in there. Then they covered them with the uh, beaver pelts. After that, we went on the side and we shoveled dirt. So everybody that was there just shoveled on top like a map. It looked like a longhouse. It was just amazing by the time it was done because it didn't fill in on the sides. We threw the dirt way in so it just mounded up and looked like a longhouse. And later they had a bulldozer come in and flatten it off and it's in a protected site that no one knows where it's at. Only select people do. When I left, Janeth took me to our, my past chief, my cousin, took me around because I'd never been to Canada, took me around to the sites that we'd lived in. And Katie LaBelle, I don't know if any of you have heard about Katie LaBelle, she wrote a book called Dispersed But Not Destroyed, and I really recommend it. If you're interested in Wyandotte history, please get it. She was raised right outside of Crawford Lake and was told that the Wyandots were killed. There were no more. And this was because in 1649, when the Iroquois came in and they wiped us out at St. Maria among the Hurons and burned Barbeau and Lamont to the stake, our people scattered, the ones that were left. But Katie grew up by Crawford Lake which is a pre-contact wind-up village. And they found proof where each of the stakes of the wind-up longhouse were, and they built them. It's beautiful. It's, it's below, it's by um, Milford, and it's below Toron uh, Tom <laughs> Toronto. Uh, so it's not too far over the border. We got there, Katie kept saying, you gotta go to Crawford Lake, you gotta go to Crawford Lake. And Janeth had never been to Crawford Lake before. Well, this was one of the really touching times to me because when we got there, there were like four school buses of kids and it was chaotic and crazy. We went around and looked at everything. When the school buses left, I told David before we left, I wanted to go down to the lake again. Look up the lake. They're finding out amazing history from that lake. It is, it's amazing. Went down to the lake and about halfway down this, it was a hot day and this ice cold breeze came across me. So I went on down to the lake and I came back, same exact spot. They set me down. They were eight wind-up women welcoming me home and thanking me for the rebirth. It impacted me. I will never forget that way. It was like we sat there for a while and just visited. I mean, it was just, I don't, I don't know how you do it, <laughs> but you kind of know. <laughs> but it was absolutely beautiful. And then I went back up to the, the truck and we came on home. But growing up, why not was um, 
just one of those things. It was it was always there. I always knew who I was. I knew our history. Mm -hmm. I knew Kansas City. I didn't know no Kansas City, Kansas, but I knew our history of Kansas City, Kansas. But boy, let me tell you, I've learned so much being involved with the nation, being involved with um, giving tours of the Quindaro site, and we are fighting for national uh, recognition for a national historical society, historical site. And hopefully we will be able to do it because Quindaro is the largest underground railroad system in the United States. My second great grandfather had one not house hotel. There was a tunnel from the river to the hotel that he would bring slaves in and then get them to safety. I didn't know this until I really got involved. Grandma didn't really talk about any of that. Um, but I'm learning so much more now. We are, we did a lot for the Underground Railroad. There was only one slave that was ever recaptured and taken back. We had protected all of it. Lorena Nichols hid them. There was um, Uncle Tom's cabin down there. If you haven't been down to the sites, they're cleaning up the area. It's, it's very primitive. There are broken foundations. Um, basically what happened there in 18... 56, it was a it was a bigger town than Kansas City, Kansas was, Wind Up City was. They they built it because of the river and because of bloody Kansas. I mean, you know, we had all these everybody was fighting and we wanted to protect. We felt that the slaves were people of the land. They were told by their owners, don't go over to Kansas. If you go over to Kansas, there's savages over there. They'll kill you. And when they did come over there, it was, we welcomed them with They were people of the land, just like we are. There were several places there. The uh, brewery still has the hatch where you can see where they would have slipped down behind the ice blocks in the brewery to protect them and hide them. Um, but when the Civil War came, we were told, if you fight the Civil War, things will be better for you. <laughs> and then the Army, Clarina Nichols came and went to uh, Fort Ledworth and asked that they come and protect Pondero. And they said, well, all the people that are living down there need to go to Kansas City, Kansas, or into Wind Up City, because it was too dangerous down there and they wouldn't be able to protect them. Well, in the meantime, while this, the army was there, they tore all the houses down. They used the houses for firewood. They used, when my second great grandfather got back, they had used his hotel as a stable for horses. Um, it was just totally destroyed. So really, Quindera only survived really well for one whole year, maybe two. Um, so it kind of ended it. Grandma tells a story of, of um, Grandpa Ebenezer Jr., her father, taking carriage rides to Quindero from Sandusky Street in Kansas City, Kansas, to Quindero to church, and he would huh? preach. I didn't know he was a preacher, but <laughs> I guess anybody could preach. But or just get, you know, get people there. The Conley sisters, on the other hand, they were really involved in the Seventh Street Methodist Church. They taught Sunday school there. Um, many influential people came out of that Sunday school class. When Lida Conley passed away. It was one of the hugest funeral services around. That cemetery was crammed to the gills with a lot of important people. Charles Curtis, he was one that took our cause and started working on protecting us. There have been several people that have jumped in there and tried their best to do whatever they could to 
to help our nation, which is good. And I just want to commend this little gal right here. Because when I first started going to the library, we were told if we didn't know what we wanted to see, we couldn't see it. Well, we had no idea what they had. <laughs> I had gotten together a group of, from all four nations at the Wind Up Women and had a conference in Parkville. And we asked Anne if she would open it up for some of the artifacts. And oh my gosh, it was just so amazing to see everything laid out on tables that we had never seen before. And that story came from William Conley, the bad guy. William Walker had given him all his artifacts and everything in safekeeping. I don't know what the cause was at the time. But when he passed away, his wife sold them all. So they went to Kansas City Public Library, Windup County Historical <laughs> Society, Kansas State Historical Society, and Nebraska State Historical Society. So they are scattered all over. And they purchased them. I mean, it, they're theirs. They, they bought them. But they are our history. There are some dictionaries in there. There's wampum in there, real wampum. Does anybody know what wampum is? Okay, wampum is, yeah, it's kind of, this is a fake wampum. Um, they were belts that were made to tell people, they would send a runner, they would take a, a belt and send a runner saying, okay, take this to this, this, this camp. And the belt would tell them what was going on, whether they were going to war, or whether there was peace, whether, you know, something else going on. But those wampum belts were our history, our, our stories. This, if any of you want to come up and look at it, is carved from a wampum shell or a cog hog shell. It is a, a special friend of mine made that for me, and these are real wampum beads. This is not, this is. <laughs> They're very time consuming to make because the shell, you have to drill the hole in the shell and then shape the bead. Because if you would shape the bead and drill the hole, they just shatter. So natives could only make like five of them a day, but they had wampum belts like crazy. Now in the night, in the, after the Civil War, at the end of the Civil War, our wampum belts that told our whole story from creation on were in a cabin in Oklahoma. And um, he was the story keeper or the storyteller. And he had to leave for the day and he locked the cabin by putting the log up against the door. And some bushwhackers came through and totally destroyed everything. We don't know if they stole the belts, if they destroyed the belts could still be out there, I don't know. But what a loss of history. So, are there any questions? I mean, I, is this what you wanted, Anne? <laughs> <laughs> yes? If they go back, they're going to go down to Oklahoma, and I don't want them to go to Oklahoma. <laughs> I want them to stay here in Wyandotte County. I want our history here because this is where, you know, Oklahoma left in 1856. Um, the government again promised them land. I, down there this week, I was told that uh, the Joel Olive Rule of 1899, if anyone got signed on to that, it was a census, so I don't understand how they got this information. But if we were on that census, then we had signed up for citizenship and we lost our federal recognition period. We did not. I, we have letters from all of our tribal members. They did not want to give up their federal or their recognition they wanted to remain Native American. And um, it's just, it's a sad story. We don't have our federal recognition here in Kansas. We are working toward it. Um, 
there's a lot of things in progress. I mean, things are just popping all the time. I am on so many Zoom meetings and so many talks and presentations, and, and I'll do anything to get our word out because I love, I love my people. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a couple of questions, um, one of which may have been answered before I came in a few minutes. It sounds like there are four different bands of Wyandotte throughout Canada and the United States. You mentioned the origination point as being Canada. Was that true for okay. all of Wyandotte? And, yes. And if so, how were they, were they forcibly removed from Canada from that origination? Okay, I didn't go into that story, but I will. In um, 1649, we were in so many different villages and longhouses all through there, through Midland. Does anybody know where Midland is? Okay, Midland and St. Maria when we are on, if you ever get a chance to go there, it's a fabulous place to visit and get history. Um, the Jesuits moved in. We had... When the Jesuits and the French fur traders came in, of course, they brought all the diseases, smallpox, measles. We went from lots of thousands of people down to really a small amount. So the Iroquois, who were very jealous of our fur trade, decided they were going to wipe us out. So they went in, at 1649, they went into St. Marie and the Huron. They put Barbeau and Lamont up at stakes and burnt them alive. Um, and they were just totally in awe that they didn't cry out. I mean, they pulled the thing and they, they did horrendous things to them, torturing them. They did not cry out. They remained with their faith, praying to God. The remaining, they killed everybody they could possibly get a hold of, and they they knew they had pretty much wiped us out. There were some windups that went to Christian Island, and they stayed in Christian Island for the winter, and they almost died because it was horrible. They had no food. The Iroquois surrounded the lake, um, and there was ice they would go back and forth on. Anytime anyone would come over on that ice, they would kill them. It was just horrendous for them. So I'll tell their story first. So they stayed there for a whole year with a Jesuit priest and then went to Quebec to be protected by the French. And that's the Wendat Nation of, of Canada, the Wendaki. My family left St. Marie among the Huron and went down through Georgian Bay to the Blue Mountains where the Tiantantes, and they were called Tiantantes, the Batuna people were the tobacco people. They were part of us. Um, they stayed there the better part of the winter and as soon as they could travel the next year and the Iroquois were still after them. They went up the Straits, went down to Michilimackinac and set up a fur trade. The Iroquois were still after them. They went to Detroit. They were still after them. They had a battle on the lake and finally settled the whole issue and stopped the persecution. So we settled in Detroit. We had um, Jesuit priests there, Catholic priests. Um, it was a really hard time. We've got a lot of land up there. I've been up there just one time. I want to go up there and explore. Oh, there's so much wind up land to explore. And they divided a lot of them because of their faith, because of the Catholic faith. Um, we've been doing a a Zoom with one of Anderdon's people, and he tells the story that Pontier, the priest, 
one year they built the, the church is still there and they had a limestone quarry and they they quarried they built everything and the foundations that are in Quindaro were all done by Wyandotte it was all built they were very smart people so one year all of the members were in Native American names in the roles the next year all British names and French names. But they discovered that Pont Portier did that to protect them because the British wanted to wipe them out at that time. So he kind of hid who they were. They had hard lives up there too. But because of the Catholic faith there was there were some disagreements and things and then Ohio they split down and went to Ohio, and a lot of them lived in, in Ohio. So Quebec and are gone in Detroit, and then Ohio was our main part and our main village. And then in 1830, the uh, Native American Indian Act came by and we were forced to move. And then in 1856, we were forced to move again. Well. Oklahoma says we can't be part of them because we stayed up here, and that's perfectly fine. We were not going to leave our graves again. We have a whole cemetery there that is sacred to us, and we are not, we're not going to leave them. We were going to protect them. And we had already started businesses up here, so we stayed. They went to Oklahoma. I'm sure they had a horrible time, I've asked. I want to hear their stories. They need to hear our stories. They don't know all of our stories. They think they do. Um, some of the stories I heard, I had to correct several times this last week. They don't know our stories. But I want to know their stories too, because I know they about starved. And I know they went down there. They came back. One year there were um, floods, so they came back to Kansas. They didn't have any money at that time. They went back down. There was a drought. They almost starved to death down there. And they came back up. There was just nothing. I mean, we couldn't help them. And I think there was a lot of bitterness from that. But you know, those, the ancestors have slowly passed away, and some of those thoughts are, even though they still know them, they are not as bitter, and things have so improved down there. And I've worked very, very hard to keep everything on a level key, be loving and giving, and, and do whatever anybody asks me to. So... Does that answer your question? Okay. I'm getting a really big history lesson here. <laughs> I love telling my history. It's wonderful. Yes, ma'am. What was the name of your second great grandfather? Ebenezer Ozane. And he was the Conley sisters' brother? He was the Conley sisters' uncle. My fourth great grandfather was Isaac Zane, and on his way in West Virginia, home from school, he was kidnapped by the Wyandotte Indians, he and his two brothers. And they kept him for several years. They ransomed the rest of him out, but Isaac did not want to go. And then he married Tarhe's daughter, Myera. And that's how our generations come down. <laughs> I think it's just getting all the paperwork together and going and I would say maybe a few more years. Yes. My dad was telling me about that. It depends on how you get elected. Yeah. Right, yes. That that does play a big role in it. But when I tell the like I went to a mayor's meeting, um, I pray um, 
week before last on Quindaro, and I spoke there. I talked to several of the commissioners afterwards, and they are just, you aren't recognized, we gotta get you recognized. And there's a lot of state representatives and stuff that say, oh, we're gonna work on this, we wanna get you recognized. So there's you a- say Oklahoma is? Oklahoma is. Yeah. I'm Pickett there's three Pickett Okay. Oklahoma, no, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, and across the border in Mexico. All three of ours are recognized. Are recognized, yeah. I'm one, I'm one from Kansas. Kansas, okay. Good. Nice not to meet you. Here. No, it's not. But we work together with, you know, every tribe we can. We love, I just love my people. I just can't say it enough. I love my people. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, would you say, like, today when you gather or you have celebrations, how are those, like, gathering similar and how are they different to like past generations? Okay. In 1911 and 12, Bar uh, Barbeau came down from Canada and there are wax cylinders that he recorded wind up people speaking. So a lot of our stories and our dances were described and everything so we have a history of it. And the Jesuit priest, I mean, clear back in 1600s, they, the Jesuit journals, I mean, good grief, the Jes Jesuit relations, there's like, I don't know how many books there are, but there are more than 15, I know. But they wrote about how our ceremonies and our language and just day-to-day -day life was. The only thing that the Jesuits did is they really kind of destroyed our matriarchal um, way of life. They did not, they thought men should be ruling, not women. So there's a book that's called She Was Chained Her by One Foot. And I haven't read it yet, but it's it deals with the Jesuits and, and taking them down and not allowing them to do it. Katie LaBelle had me on a committee for the Daughters of Autensic. It's another book that she wrote. Uh, we did seven life stories. Uh, one was when the Jesuit priests were here. Um, I can't remember them all. Lida Conley was in there. Linda Suey's uh, mother, Eleanor, was in there. Jane Zane Gordon was in there. There's We picked seven women for her to write about. You were saying about the uh, Iroquois <laughs> running, running the wine out the same thing. Oh, yes, they did. They moved us out to Ohio. Oh, yes, they did. That was part of our settlement. But so we were more Northeast. Right. We were looking at people. Yeah, well, we are too. Yeah, and but now, of course, we're here. Right. But they did that because on top of all that, my son, as a, he's on his way down from Canada. He married a beautiful woman. Oh, good. And, uh, <laughs> and they used to have the little. little they're little they, tea to teas. Yeah, they've been together now 23 years. Good. Three boys. Sure. Uh, anyway, uh, but they would go at it. She, she actually, she really didn't know. <laughs> she heard it. <laughs> My son is a teacher. He travels the world right now. He's an MC and he's an indigenous teacher. He Bless his heart. heart. Uh, and he's a, a powwow MC. He does the powwow drill and I follow the most of the time. But anyway, so when they first got together, I thought it was really interesting. Yes. They know that they really didn't like us. Right. <laughs> Not in the sense, but it's just the way the Iroquois worked. Sure, they were. They were. They I wanted to I dominate. I didn't know about they did it to the wine guy. Oh, of yes. course, I know I heard all about the Kickapoo. Sure. And we fought back, but then we all, the Kickapoo is, means uh, one who runs about or stands about. So mm -hmm. we're ready to move on. Right. But, but, okay, now we're down here. And Mexico opened up uh, Hope State. Right across the Eagle Pass, okay. a lot of the Kickapoos are all right there. Right. The original one, they speak the language. They still, they still yeah. practice the traditional ways. Wonderful. We still practice our, don't get me wrong, we've sure. lost a lot. You know, we lot. all and have lost sad. so much yeah. because... But it's changing, but yes. we have lost a lot. Yes. And the United States in schools, they don't teach they don't want this. To teach. They don't want you to know what they've done to the Native Americans. Yeah. 
So they don't. Sad. It is very and sad. The atrocity is horrible. Yes. It's horrifying. Yes. This is so right. Yes. And what the water made is still think of it. It's there. But it's still our land. It is. We don't own it. We belong no. to it. Right. We are the people, we are the people of, of the land. land. Yes. The original people of this land. Yes. Yes. A lot of people think, oh, you just want your land back. No. Everybody's like, no, that's not like that. We would like to have more say so. Yeah. And how the land is you know, taken care of. Like you were saying, mm-hmm. it's our, she's our mother. Right. She's everything to us. She's everything to everybody. Absolutely. How are we going to survive without our money? That's right. But some people look at it, well, I can buy this much. We still don't like it that way. Many tribes. The little tribes are all different. Yes. But many tribes still need to be on the The ones yes. that are really on the reservation. They still practice their traditional ways, but the ones that are assimilated, we were assimilated. I've assimilated, but I'm, I've changed. I, I've got seven grandchildren, and I've learned a lot the past 30 years because of my son. Now, I'm just in high school, I started having new traffic. Bless you. Yeah, he's, a, he's amazing. Yes, he's really, bless he's you. He's on his way down. He should be here about midnight. Yeah. The River Raisin, I don't know, um, that was another battle. Um, yes, it was 1812, the Battle of 1812, the River Raisin. Uh, that's another one of our big history points. And the people in the River Raisin battlefield, um, they have been trying to work on a, a way to teach in schools. Mm-hmm. And they're getting it uh, worked through. So, Definitely. yes, yeah. There's a whole lot of history that needs to be told, though. Actually, I think it's either today or tomorrow in Canada. I checked this. I'm on in like 10, 15, 20 native sites on the okay. Facebook. In Canada, today or tomorrow, they're having a big uh, reconciliation yes. gathering yes. for the, uh, the children. Yes. And, oh, the children. Oh. You know, I saw the... Right. I saw a map the other day. I did not realize boarding schools were so prevalent in the United States. I thought it was mostly Canada. Man, I saw a picture, and it's just covered. All the little dots have totally covered the United States. And Canada. Yes. Oh, yes, and Canada. Yes. Yes. But I think in the United States, I think it was mostly Quakers. And I think they were probably a little bit better off than when it, the Jesuit priests and oh, the Catholic priests. And the priests. I they do do a lot more than we do down here. Yes, they do. To follow up with their residential school. Yes. Uh, history. Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. you know anything about the Time I've gone up there, they've been closed. But um, yeah, we ran that whole area. We were all over that area. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, that's what I was looking at. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, my question is about the word Huron. So, Huron is Very good question. When the French came over, they said that we looked they call this Huron, which means the bristly hairs on the back of a board because of our headdress. And that's where the name Huron came from. It has absolutely nothing to do with our history. It is a French slanderous word to describe us. But you know, after a while, you just pick it up. And when we came to Kansas, we just, you know, what do you do? You don't fight against it all. Okay, second question. Do you know Kristen? She's my cousin. Kristen and Holly and yep. <laughs> We're all saints. Yes, ma'am. Where did you find out your land? Um no, not really. The state of Kansas said that we were supposed to have been given 10 years to get on our feet, get our businesses together before they were going to tax us. But then when it came to being declared a state and the settlers wanted to come in, it's like there was just no hope. They just started taxing us. Most of them either lost it or sold it. There are a few people with allotments that are Throughout the United States, um, several of our people, one of them have an allotment in Colorado, one has an allotment in 
Oregon. My grandma had allotment in Oregon, but during her, I mean, you know, depression time, she sold it. So we no longer have that. But some of these people have held on to their allotment lands. Yes, there was another. Yes. I mean, it's hard to dispute now that a change or abrupt climate <laughs> disruption is, you know, exponentiating and the fossil fuel industry has driven us to where human beings, you know, as a species may become extinct. Is there anything that your people, your tradition, your practices might teach us to help re reverse the... Go back to the land. That's all we can do. All of this concrete is not helping with global warming. And I just read an article of, um, what is it, the gases that the cattle give off? Methane. Yes. There is a lake up in Alaska that is giving off massive doses of that. It's bubbling up. You know... <laughs> But if we keep building concrete, if we keep tearing out the trees, the grass, we need to go back to natural herbs for our medicines. And I have very much started learning herbal medicine. And my son-in-law calls me, oh, what witches brew are you making of the day? <laughs> but you know, a lot of those medicines came, a lot of the medicines today came from what the Native Americans used as medicine anyway. We need to go back <clears throat> to the natural ways. And I think that's the only way that we can ever survive if we... Yes, ma'am. And side by side instead of <laughs> 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 it is. <laughs> Helena said that she had a dream from her father that said protect the cemetery. And she had a woman that is supposedly buried at the cemetery that came to her and, and she was proclaimed a witch. I have no idea where she's buried or who she was that said, do you want power or do you want money? And she says, oh, I want power. <laughs> and believe you me, that curse she put on, curse be the villain that molests these grapes, still runs today. Tom um, Keffler, he's an Oklahoma wine dot, he was an archeologist, he since has health issues and can't do anything anymore, but he came up to clean up the graves. <laughs> And he had all of them done except Helena's. And it was sunk down in the ground. He used his trifold and he's jacking, trying to get it up, wouldn't budge. Brought his truck up there, tried to get it, wouldn't budge. He finally said, Helena, I'm here to help you. Check the graves. He said it came up like butter. <laughs> My dad told me a story, and I, yeah, I think he was probably about 10 or 12 years old, that Grandpa had gone to get his hair cut over across the street. And um, he went up to see his brother's grave. And Helena came yelling at him, who are you? How dare you come on you know, our sacred ground? And he said, oh, I just came to see my baby brother. And she asked his name, and when she heard it, she knew who he was. And they sat and talked for as long as until Grandpa came and got him. But um, she was she was a force. Let me tell you. They say that went that people would watch her from the streets because she would keep the cemetery cleaned up. So if a tree limb fell or whatever, she take and she'd be hacking that limb up or whatever. And they say the play of her muscles and so interesting. I mean, just. We have a little gal called Maddie Easley from Oklahoma Wine Dot that is a playwright in New York City and New York Theater, and she is writing a play on the Conway Sisters that will be coming out soon. Kansas City Repertory Theater had contracted her to, to do this, 
And I had the privilege of giving her and her family. She grew up in Kansas City, but had never again been to the cemetery. So she got a why not lesson. <laughs> and I have been on multiple Zooms and sending her articles and everything I can. And I've just, I've literally shared all of my Conley history and the Huron Indian history, all the papers. I'm a, I'm a copier. One of these days, there's not going to be a computer, and I'm going to have a copy. <laughs> I have five books that are each of them about this thing. And Ty Edwards from J uh, J Johnson County Community College has taken all of them, and they're making copies for each of us on the committee, and, and we ought to get you one, too. So, yes, ma'am. I've got cards. Yep. You just get a hold of me. And um, my second chief, Louisa Libby, does a lot of the Quindaro tours. I try to get, we've had to kind of divide things up. <laughs> it gets so hectic at times. I mean, I could be down here almost all the time. But uh, I usually do the cemetery. She usually does Quindaro. But I'll give you a card. You can um, email me and we'll set it up. <laughs> Oklahoma has promised me since 2008 they would fence that cemetery in. <laughs> and every year I go to them and I ask. And right now, I don't know, their excuse is something about the, the person they've contracted with having getting a hold of him or whatever. Yes, David? Well, that too. Yes. Yes, the library was going to expand too. Yes, David? St. John's Church. And it could be, I would say probably it might be Delaware, if anything, because that was Delaware land, and most everybody wind up was buried at Wyandotte or in the Quindaro Cemetery. What I'm talking about is but they said they don't know where it came from, and then in the 1950s, I don't know anything about it. I'll have to check that out. Yes. Strawberry Hill, by the way. Um, when our people die, they're walking among the strawberries. And here on Cemetery used to be full of strawberries. And that whole hill, Strawberry Hill, was loaded with strawberries. Some of them say, oh, no, that's not how they got their name. <laughs> but it was loaded with strawberries. And, and yes, yes. And when I went to Anderdon last year, we were in a cemetery. And it was so, I just stopped, and there were strawberries, ripe strawberries right in front of me. So they're walking among the strawberries. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any approximate numbers of how many wind up people are in Kansas? And the whole wind up nation amongst the four bands? Oklahoma has above 7,000. <clears> I know we have about 600. I do not know the numbers of Anderdon or um, Quebec, but they're pretty good numbers too. Yes, and there are a lot of Oklahoma wine dogs that live. Marilyn Young, who she uh, gave me a message today saying, I wanted to be at your talk so bad today, but I got to watch my grandkids. So, uh, but she's Oklahoma wine dog. There's a lot of Oklahoma wine dogs that live in Kansas. It's a lot that came back. Yes, ma'am. Are there opportunities 
right now it is mostly adults, but my grandson Logan stands behind me at the computer. Every town in Oklahoma, Becky went right to Logan. Okay, Logan, what's this? <laughs> and he, you know, he told her. So, yes, ma'am. There's no ignorance. So, there was a great one at the school. When I was 13, she took me to the ruins of an Indian mission that was around 118th in this state avenue and was burned. When she was passing away, she was horribly concerned because the government had promised. They, they were taking over the ruins to build all the hoopla. Mm -hmm. And they had promised they would do something, clap somebody. And she said she was so concerned that they weren't following through what was going to happen. Was this a mission for why not Indians? No. And well, the Shawnee Indians that clapped it. Yeah, the Shawnee Indian Mission first originated in Turner, right against the river. And that's probably what you're talking about. No? No, no it was the uh, I went. Okay. I went, we saw that they had, still had the corn uh, that contradicts the big wheel that they ground the corn and stuff. And it was uh, the two Piper and Edwardsville in the back pasture of a hundred that would have been Delaware. Okay. Yeah. Our land started right behind on the east side of uh, Kinsey Community College. I don't remember what street that is. It comes straight down, straight to the river. So river to river. And we were always to the east. Did you ever work with Paula Williams or Twyla Williams? Uh, Twyla Williams, her name's familiar. I don't know why, but no. <laughs> Okay, and probably Jan English had something to do with her. Oh, yes. Yes. And there's uh, there's a saying, we just don't mess with the one dot woman. <laughs> <laughs> chapter and we have so much affection for Jan and uh, it was she came to our 60th reunion celebration and did a very informative beautiful presentation about she does a wonderful job and she taught us all to say first nation peoples mm -hmm. and so in her honor we do that in that word A lot of people ask me, do I object to being called Indian? Well, I, I don't really like it, but it's just kind of an accepted language. Um, I would rather be a First Nations or Indigenous. And you tell them next time you see them, that it's a Indian Okay, I will. I, did you come to the DAR um, tour that I gave last year? You did not? Okay. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, they invited several different chapters, so. I did have an opportunity to go to the cemetery and speaking about our youth group from Trinity and uh, to the Poyero Center, and, and they took us. Uh, to the lookout for the signal to me and uh, I have some common ancestors. Mm -hmm. So you're tied to us too? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am.
I don't know a whole lot about it. I do know that she organized a lot. She was a very empowering person and she did not take no for an answer. <laughs> so there are a lot of, uh, there is a, um, I don't know if it's a homeless shelter or a health shelter for women in the Argentine district that asked for permission to call the house, the Lydot Conley House. And I just think it's great that, you know, every time that she's honored, I think it's a wonderful thing. It keeps her memory alive. She would, she would be so, all of them, all, all of the sisters would be just so blown away with what's happening today. Anything else? Okay. So, I've got a question about the question about the I also heard Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we've talked to Mayor Gardner and he wants Louisa and I to get in touch with um, LaVert Murray and we're asking for a piece of that land to be given back to us so that we have a land established site. Yes ma'am. Silly question. Oh. The casino that's down. Sorry. Oh yeah. No. <laughs> no. Is it connected? It is not ours. I absolutely, every time I see that commercial, I just want to throw up. <laughs> Billy knows how I feel about that, too, that she's down in Oklahoma. Um, I, yeah, we have nothing to do with the casino. Won't ever have anything to do with it. So, yes, ma'am. Upkeep of the cemetery, yes. They made an agreement when they took over that building that they would do the upkeep of it and keep a guard on it, which they have been doing. I just wish we'd get, I really wish we would get a fence and a retaining wall because the east side of the cemetery, Jan has found femurs sticking out. We need to get that totally protected and fenced off, walled off. Yes. Staircase has been one of those. I, I would love to have the staircase, but I do understand why they don't want to put it there because of security reasons. It's so hard with the homeless to keep a good eye on it. And if they ever get that fenced off, they only want one entrance in and out. Yes, Dave. They do security Yes, they do. Yes. That's what they do. I just, I cringe every time I have to walk through that bus stop, though. Yeah. It's not a pleasant walk. Anybody else? Okay. The pictures and things of maps of where we came from, if anybody would like to look at those, I have them in a notebook up here.